Um, I'm David Wilkins. I'm Lumbee from North Carolina with my cousin sitting over here. Uh, it's nice to see the Lumbees colonizing the Lummi from, from Lumbee country. Um, it's always good to come back. I've been doing this for a number of years now, and uh, it's not quite the same without Steve or, or having Vine, uh, but we're here and we're doing important work, all of us. Um, I'm honored to be on the, the lands of the, the Lummi people, and I appreciate um, the opportunity to, to be here. Hank was supposed to be with us, as some of you know. Um, he was in the original preliminary agenda, but he's had health issues for some time, and he wasn't able to make it. Um, and so I'm going to be speaking about a column that he and I wrote together with, uh, with my wife's help. Um, and so that's what I want to talk about. Um, certain letters, as we know, um, uh, capture our history, culture, and politics well. And the R letter, which is featured in this year's uh, theme, uh, is particularly important. Resources, relatives, reciprocity, respect, responsibility, and resistance. Uh, those are all wonderful words, and we've been hearing them uh, throughout the conference. Of course, there's a darker side of words that also begin with R. Requirmiento. Thank you. Um, removal, reservations, reclamation, relocation, radiation, and you could go on, right? Today, today's letter, of course, is the C word. Um, many policies, laws, and personalities begin with C. Uh, and so with my wife's help, I just came up with a little laundry list of, of C words, beginning with Columbus, of course, right? Conquest, colonialism, Christianity, Custer, right? Can't forget Custer. Collier, John Collier, Cohen, Felix Cohen, uh, conquistadores, uh, constitutions, Conciliation, consensus, Cortez, contract, corporations, checkerboard, capitalism, corruption, co-optation, capitulation, crusades, and we could go on with those. I do an occasional lecture where I talk about the R words and the D words. I'm not going to get into the Ds. That's a different, a different lecture. <laughs> um, but the two where I'm concerned about uh, and that Hank and I were concerned about um, are, of course, c consent and consultation. We heard consultation earlier uh, from John McCoy and the other uh, uh, representative. For Vine, uh, the concept of consent was one of the most important political principles, and he laced it throughout many of his uh, books and articles. And he was convinced that until and unless the United States grounded all of its policies uh, in the doctrine, there would never be justice for indigenous uh, peoples. Native peoples ourselves were historically steeped in the idea and the understanding of consent. And the U.S., in theory, uh, is founded upon the principle of the consent of the governed, right? We hear that all the time. If you take American Politics 101, that's what you're, uh, you know, hit over the head with constantly that the United States as a democracy believes in the consent of the governed. Developments over the last couple of years um, uh, prompted me to want to write about the meaning and relationship between consent and consultation. And I remember the talk that my wife and I attended at Evergreen that Hank gave three or four years ago, I guess it was, where he talked about the differences between consent and consultation. Um, and then just you know, a few months ago, there was something that prompted me, uh, and I heard someone talking about consultation, and again, how it had been, mis had been abused, and Native peoples had not really been consented. And so I told my wife, I said, I want to write a column about that, and I'm going to see if I can't rope Hank into joining me on it. And darn if he didn't do that. Uh, so, so I really am sad that he couldn't be here today. Uh, so I wrote the draft, and I sent it to Hank, and he edited it and added a bunch of good stuff. Then I handed it to my wife, the best editor in the world, and she did her thing and turned it into a piece that we published in Indian Country Today. Um, and you can go online and find that. So I want to talk about that, basically, uh, 
And I think it does build upon this because in the framework that Hula has laid out, we don't see a whole lot of consent of indigenous peoples. And we know that worldwide indigenous peoples have not fully been consented, uh, had not had their consent sought, uh, although consultation has become increasingly important. But let me begin and get through this um, and um, see what you think. The concepts of consent and consultation are receiving a lot of attention these days. And just last week, the attorney general of this state, um, um, Bob Ferguson, announced a new consent and consultation policy. Did anybody catch that? It was a big deal, um, and you should look it up. Uh, though I've been told by a number of knowledgeable people, including Gabe Galanda, that a lot of, not a lot of Native leaders were consulted or consented to that policy. Right? And yet, again, if you read it, it sounds very promising. Um, Bon Sharp apparently was made aware of it, um, but not a lot of other Native leaders. So again, uh, we have that to deal with. Um, lately, consultation has gained the upper hand in the parlance of intergovernmental relations, while consent has a storied history as a vital political doctrine tracing back to the origins of our nations and the earliest days of indigenous state interactions. While we all think we know what it means to be consulted or to give consent, these familiar ideas are being reworked and sometimes used as weapons by those who seek to weaken and destroy native sovereignty and self-determination. And of course, the Me Too movement is also all about consent as well, right? Consent and consultation are often used interchangeably, but they are far from equivalent terms. Consultation is a formal process rooted in communication. It's about sharing information and listening to differing perspectives, an exchange that is one of the required mileposts on the road to meaningful consent. Consent, according to the Oxford Dictionary, is the act of giving approval or coming to an agreement in opinion or sentiment. Treaties, at least the early treaties, are good examples of mutual consent between a native nation and the federal government. Consent, unlike consultation, involves taking responsibility for an outcome which, in effect, becomes the doing of the consenter, even though they may not have initiated the action. You could give consent without first going through the process of consultation, but consultation in and of itself is not a complete act. It's just a tool. Right? We have seen many examples of state, local, and federal governments and corporations claiming consultation fulfills their obligation to our nations. That somehow sending an email to a tribal leader, whether response is received or not, is the equivalent of consultation. Even more galling is that this box checking is often used as a substitute, not just for the process of consultation, but for the act of consent. That was at the heart of the Standing Rock movement, right? The Corps of Engineers and the corporations claimed they had consulted with the tribes, and the tribes said, no, you haven't. Uh, and that was a foundation of that uh, powerful dispute. In the context of indigenous state relations, consent is a fundamental political principle and is generally understood as constituting the core legitimacy of a political body. The idea being that the institutions and actions of government officials must be based on the free will of those engaging in political activity. The principle of indigenous consent was visible in diplomatic relations between our nations and European powers and later the federal government dating back to the early 1600s and continuing through the early 1900s. And for the nearly 400 treaties that were ratified by the US government, the central element of consent remains a binding obligation on both parties. Consent is also embedded in the 1787 Northwest Ordinance, and Vine frequently cited that as a fundamental doctrine that should be a governing principle between the United States and Native nations. Because that uh, doctrine has a famous line that many of you have heard, the utmost good faith shall always be observed toward the Indians. Their lands and property shall never be taken from them without their consent, right? That's a foundational political document of the United States government that has been frequently violated, as we all know. 
Historically, consent was theoretically supposed to work to the benefit of all parties. Article 1, for example, of the Kansas Treaty of 1825 declares that, quote, the chiefs and headmen of the Kansas nation for themselves and their nation do consent and agree that the commissioner of the United States shall and may survey and may mark out a road, thus granting access to the fledgling U.S. government. A decade later, uh, the United States in the Removal Treaty of 1834 promised the Chickasaw Quote, the government of the U.S. hereby consents to protect and defend them against the inroads of any other tribe of Indians and from the whites. All right. Consent. And in 1898, 27 years after treaty making ostensibly ended in 1871, the Lakota people of Rosebud signed an agreement with James McLaughlin, the U.S. Indian inspector, in which they gave permission and consent for members of the lower Brule community to reside on their land. And finally, consent is also manifest in several articles of the 2007 United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Article 19 shows the more appropriate relationship and progression between consultation and consent when it declares the following. States shall consult and cooperate in good faith with the indigenous peoples concerned through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free, prior, and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislative or administrative measures that may affect them. And you find that language in several places in UNDRIP. Consent for all of its power is not, of course, flawless. In the context of native state relations, this principle and its promises have also been twisted and violated time and again by federal policymakers whenever it was deemed politically, economically, or culturally expedient. Hundreds of treaty provisions, for example, have been nullified by federal lawmakers, and Congress has enacted countless laws, including the infamous Public Law 280 uh, in 1953, which for the first time gave five states criminal jurisdiction. John talked about this a little while ago, over natives and non-natives on reservations, with a few exceptions, and allowed every other state to wield similar jurisdiction if they chose to do so and modified their constitutions. This profound violation of tribal sovereignty and territorial integrity was authorized by Congress and gifted to the states without our consent, despite the fact that President Dwight Eisenhower, in signing the measure into law, said, quote, I have grave doubts as to the wisdom of certain provisions because the law did not require our consent. Eisenhower deemed that flaw, quote, unfortunate and he expressed hope that the next session of Congress would adopt an amendment to the law requiring our consent before being subjected to state jurisdiction. But that consent provision was never inserted into the law until 1968, right, under the Indian Civil Rights Act. Notwithstanding the inadequacies of consent's protective cloak over indigenous rights, it remains a fundamentally important principle and serves to remind federal and state officials that a nation's democratic character requires consent from the people and the peoples it engages with. Today, however, consent seems to have been relegated to a back row seat in comparison to consultation in the way intergovernmental relations are being practiced. When consultation has been stripped of its meaning and reduced to the process of informing and replaces the act of consent the power of native sovereignty and self-determination is irreparably harmed. Consultation, by contrast, is a far more modern concept that was initially used to define a respectful process of meaningful engagement between our nations and the other governments. Federal officials first implicitly endorsed consultation in 1968 when President Lyndon Johnson announced his administration's intent to abandon termination policy. Um, to replace that with native self-help, self-development, and self-determination. He reasoned that, quote, Indians must have a voice. Thank you, President Johnson, um, in programs and decisions that mattered to us. In 1989, more than a decade after the Federal Bolt decision ended the violent fish wars, by affirming treaty rights, leaders in Washington state chose a new path that emphasized consultation rather than litigation or coercion. We heard a little bit about that uh, from Amy and the, the previous panel. 
Governor Booth Gardner worked with the leaders of the 26 Native uh, nations to craft the Centennial Accord, a document that institutionalized a commitment to government-to-government -to -government relations rooted in cooperation, negotiation, and arbitration. Washington's Accord transformed and continues to guide the dealings between the now 29 federally recognized tribes in the state, although apparently Yakima is not part of that, I'm not sure. Um, with the signing of the 2004 Out-of-State Accord, Governor Gary Locke and leaders of federally recognized tribes located in Oregon and Idaho with treaty reserve rights in Washington came to a similar arrangement. The success of these accords has provided a model for tribal state relations in other states, including the state I still reside in right now, Minnesota, as well as Arizona, California, uh, and Wisconsin as well. While the process of consultation was obviously understood and practiced in these situations, it was not explicitly defined and codified in federal policy until President Bill Clinton's 1994 Memorandum on Government to Government Relations with Native American Tribal Governments. That document declared, quote, each executive department and agency shall consult to the greatest extent practicable and to the extent permitted by law tribal governments prior to taking actions that affect federally recognized tribal governments. All such consultations are to be open and candid so that all interested parties may evaluate for themselves the pertinent, the potential impact of relevant proposals, end of quote. It appeared to be a positive step toward establishing and improving communications in a bureaucratic world where tribes were often excluded, either deliberately or through negligence from decision making through some, uh, though some legal scholars such as Jason Searle in a 2017 article exploring alternatives to the consultation or consent paradigm see the origins of the elevation of consultation over consent in Clinton's executive order. So that seems to be when consultation really sort of took off and consent sort of was pushed to the side. Unfortunately, genuine engagement in be is becoming rarer and what has emerged over the last several years is an empty, distorted version of consultation whereby outside governments, corporations, and other entities claim to have consulted with tribal governments when in actuality, they have done little more than inform them of an intent to act without input or notice. Obviously, telling someone that you plan to do something is not the same as consulting them in the creation of that plan. Yet those who seek to extract resources or obtain access through tribal lands with little regard for treaty rights or respect for the integrity of tribal nations' inherent sovereignty are using the term in just this way. They disingenuously claim to have consulted with Native peoples while diminishing the entire process. Those tribal leaders who attempt to engage in a true process of consultation are often penalized. Those seeking to exploit them can claim to have accepted native input and then proceed to ignore it, merely checking a box in the event of legal action. This is a far cry from the original intent of meaningful inclusion and respectful partnership. Indian country, in effect, has been gaslighted and abused by those working under the cover of this bad faith definition. Consultation that is not wedded explicitly to securing meaningful and informed native consent is inherently flawed and inadequate as a tool that can truly benefit the complicated nature of native state relations. As native nations have learned since the Clinton years, consultation is inconsistently administered by federal and state officials. It also tends to be a process confined in many instances to the executive branches of both the federal and state governments and thus lacks comprehensive scope. What about the courts? What about the legislature? Finally, and most importantly, consultation as practice is more procedural than substantive. And this is where it really gets to it. Um, this means it is inadequate and ill-equipped to acknowledge the emotional, historical, political, and legal concerns, rights, and understandings of our peoples. Indigenous leaders would be well advised to remember their ancestors' deep understanding and commitment to diplomacy and remind federal, state, municipal, and corporate figures that their consent cannot be forcibly secured or consulted away. It can only be given freely, openly, and before any alteration or reduction of their lands, inherent rights, or political status. Thank you very much.